Thank you for listening, downloading, sharing, subscribing, commenting, donating, and praying for us. And for going to BrotherLance.com to get the free PDF of this teaching. Hello, this is Brother Lance, and this is the Christian Soul Prepper Podcast Persecution Series, Episode 12. Today we'll be covering chapters 35 and 36 of my book, We Shall Be Like Him, Carry Your Cross, Parts 1 and 2. Be sure to go to WeShallBeLikeHim.com and download your free copy today. And please do share this blessing with those you want to be encouraged in their walk with God. And thank you for subscribing, downloading, and sharing these podcasts. Together we could spread the love of Jesus. We are on a mission to help the body of Christ worldwide. Preparing the faithful for the second coming of Jesus Christ. We do this by exposing the tricks of the devil, diving deep into the Word of God, and doing life together. Along the way, we'll include a power promise to claim and ridiculous trivia. We are not alone. We have a divine hope for home. Welcome to the Christian Soul Prepper Podcast. Right here, right now, we give you the God's honest truth. Sure to bookmark brotherlance.com for all the latest podcast, video, Bible study, social media, and more. Now, here's your host, Brother Lance. We are not an island unto ourselves, we are the body of Christ, and I need your help to share this information with those you love and care for. My role in the body is to search out the things of God and teach others. We all have the role of sharing godly information and our testimony with those around us so we can be a light in the world. Thank you in advance for being that light and sharing this information. Freely you have received, freely give in response. Thank you. Today we'll be covering parts one and two of a four-part section in my book, We Shall Be Like Him. It'll show us how to carry our cross and follow Jesus, just as he instructed us to. So without further delay, let's begin. Day 35. Carry your cross, part one. Precept number five. For he was teaching his disciples, saying, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed after three days, he will rise. Mark 9, 31. Let's pray. Daddy, I know many people have given their lives because of their faith in Jesus. They have risen to the call of our Lord. I know you will raise them from the dead victorious. They have not truly died nor will they ever die again. I ask you to protect our minds from the evil one. Help us not to believe his lies. Death upon this earth is just a gateway to eternity for all who call upon Christ. It's never the end, just the beginning. I know we will not all have to give our lives through the physical death for the gospel. So my prayer is that you empower us to live for the call of Christ. In Jesus' precious and holy name we pray, amen. The greatest love you can show is to give your life for your friends. John 15, 13. I, Jesus, don't call you servants anymore because a servant doesn't know what his master is doing. But I've called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. John 15, 15. Jesus freely gave his life for us. He suffered the most painful form of execution available at the time, crucifixion. He also knew this moment was coming. I'm sure that Jesus had seen many people hanging on crosses for their crimes. The Romans were very fond of this form of punishment. I'm confident that his disciples also witnessed these executions take place. It was no strange thing in the days of the Roman occupation of Israel. So when we read this verse, please understand the proximity of this form of execution. The Father loves me because I give my life in order to take it back again. No one takes my life from me. I give my life of my own free will. I have the authority to give my life, and I have the authority to take my life back again. This is what my Father ordered me to do. John 10, 17-18 Jesus is telling the disciples, I'm going to carry my cross and die upon it. That's my paraphrased version, of course. This is what was being conveyed to them. Later on in Scripture, we read, Then Pilate handed Jesus over to them to be crucified. So the soldiers took Jesus, he carried his own cross, 
and went out of the city to a location called the Skull. In Hebrew, this place is called Golgotha. John 19, 16 through 17. There, Jesus died for our sins. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death on the cross. Philippians 2, 8. We find the exact moment spoken about in the Gospel of John. After Jesus had taken the vinegar, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and died. John 19.30 Jesus was victorious, being faithful to the end. Every person in Jerusalem was intimately equated with crucifixion. To say it in modern terms, imagine being near the room where they kill inmates by electrocution, then being told that if you want to follow me, you must sit down upon the electric chair. We know exactly what that means. If I said, if you want to follow me, you must stand before the firing squad. We know of this type of execution. The disciples knew the pains of crucifixion very well. With this in mind, please understand what we are being told by Jesus. Jesus told the, told the crowd and the disciples to come closer. And he said, if any of you want to be my followers, you must forget about yourself. You must take up your cross and follow me. If you want to save your life, you will destroy it. But if you give up your life for me and for the good news, you will save it. What will you gain if you own the whole world but destroy yourself? What could you give to get back your soul? Mark eight thirty four through 37 I promise you, people did not carry crosses around for fun and games. Those who carry crosses knew they were going to die. If we are going to truly be followers of Jesus, we must carry our crosses as he carried his. What does that mean? It means we have to die to ourselves. And yes, be willing to literally die for him. We must stand before the firing squad. We must sit in the electric chair. And we must place the rope around our own necks. We must die to ourselves and be willing to die. He said to all of them, those who want to come with me must say no to the things they want. Pick up their crosses every day and follow me. Luke 9, 23. There is no way to soft pedal this. All I can do is to tell you the truth. This is what is required of us all. I will share one more verse and then clarify it for you. Let's read. You cannot be my disciples unless you love me more than you love your father and your mother, your wife, your children, your brothers and sisters. You cannot come with me unless you love me more than you love your own life. You cannot be my disciples unless you carry your own cross and come with me. Luke 14, 26 through 27. If you wanted to know what is required of you by Jesus, it's everything. Everything is required. He wants your heart, mind, and soul. All of you is what is required. Nothing less will do. I want to clarify something, though. A lot of people take this verse the wrong way. We are to love our families. We are just to love Jesus to the utmost. A great clarification of this is found in Ephesians. It says, A husband shall love his wife as much as Christ loved the church and gave his life for it. Ephesians 5.25 Jesus is not telling us not to love anything but him. He is saying that we should love him supremely. When this happens, I believe we can then understand how to truly love our families. It takes sacrifice and selflessness. Be encouraged, family. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I, Jesus, came that they may have life and have it abundantly. John 10.10 If we ever have to die for our faith, please be encouraged with this promise. God will raise us from death by the same power that he used when he raised our Lord to life. 1 Corinthians six. 14. You might not realize that in order to become a Christian, you have already died. To become part of the body of Christ, you have already practiced dying for Jesus. We have all hung on a cross and went into the grave. We have also been resurrected with him. This sacred passion is performed through baptism. Let's read. Do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. So that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so also should walk in the newness of life. For if we have been joined together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him in order that the body of sin may be destroyed. That for now on we should not serve sin, for he who died has been justified from sin. But... If we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that when Christ was raised from the dead, he dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him, for in that he died, he died to sin once. But in that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, count yourself also to be truly dead to sin, but alive to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
Romans 6, 3 through 11. This is not a one and done death. Yes, for the spiritual man is complete through baptism. Your spiritual spirit is renewed in Christ Jesus. For the fleshy mortal man, this suit of rebellious skin must be subdued daily. I protest, brothers, my pride in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die every day. 1 Corinthians 15, 31. We fight against our sin nature daily and must bring it into conformity to our Lord's will. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul, 1 Peter 2, 11. Be encouraged, family, just like the battle that rages daily in the flesh. We're also renewed daily in the spirit to give us strength. That is why we are not discouraged, though outwardly we are wearing out. Inwardly, we are renewed day by day. Our suffering is light and temporary and is producing for us an eternal glory that is greater than anything we can imagine. We don't look for the things that can be seen, but for the things that can't be seen. The things that can be seen are only temporary, but the things that can't be seen last forever. 2 Corinthians 4, 16-18 We need to examine the steps of baptism. This way we can get a better understanding of the death we must die. The true Accurate and holy word of God tells us, if you declare that Jesus is Lord and believe that God brought him back to life, you will be saved. Believing, you receive God's approval, and by declaring your faith, you are saved. Romans 10, 9-10. Some point to this scripture as a way to undercut the necessity of baptism. Trust me, it doesn't. I believe this scripture performs two things. It encourages those who physically could not get baptized before they died. Example, a prisoner like the one on the cross accepts Jesus. He's about to die. There is no way to get baptized. His belief makes him complete in the Lord. It is also saying, if you believe Jesus is Lord, then by default, you'll get baptized. Jesus told us to do that. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Mark 16, 16. Did you see it? If you believe, you will be getting baptized. It is the default position of an obedient believer. If you do not believe, then there is no baptism for you to receive, and you're condemned yourself through unbelief. Baptism is the natural response of belief in the Lord. Let's spread the good news about the kingdom of God and that one named Jesus Christ, men and women believed him and were baptized, Acts 8, 12. So we must hear the good news and believe it. Let's look up the next step. Peter answered, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the Holy Spirit as a gift, Acts 2, 38. Therefore, we must hear, believe, repent, and then be baptized. We take these steps for the forgiveness of our sins. Then we can receive the gift of promise, the Holy Spirit. Now let's look at the rules of procedure of being baptized. Jesus tells us, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Matthew twenty-eight nineteen. If it is not done in this manner, then it is not baptism. Period. It has to be performed in the name of the Father, Yahweh, and of the Son, Jesus, or Yeshua, and the Holy Ghost, or Holy Spirit. Some might argue these exact words have to be said. I believe that if you follow the Lord, these words will not be hard to speak at the time of baptism. I also believe that just because you say the names does not mean you're actually doing it in their name. The third commandment makes this clear. You shall not take or use the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Exodus 27. Let me make it plain. If your heart is right before the Lord, then you'll want to say the most beautiful names ever spoken. With a pure heart, it will not be in vain that you speak them or that you have baptized someone. That being said, I should clarify something. The person being baptized, having a pure heart towards God, is covered in God's grace, no matter the heart of the baptizer. But who can account for the heart and purity of everyone who baptizes? It is God that makes you holy, not the baptizer. Now a warning, if you baptize in their name, you will be held accountable for better or worse. We must engage in this sacred performance with the utmost sobriety. I know this might seem like a huge detour from our topic. I promise you it's not. The reason we have covered this in so much depth is the importance and connection to carrying our cross for Jesus. You see, when we are baptized, we are washed. What are you waiting for now? Get up, be baptized, and have your sins washed away as you call on his name. Acts twenty two sixteen. This washing is performed in water. It spiritually represents the blood of Jesus, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Revelation 1, 5. In baptism, we die the death with him. Let's read. 
This happened when you were placed in the tomb with Christ through baptism. In baptism, you were also brought back to life with Christ through faith in the power of God, who brought him back to life, Colossians 2.12. This is why baptism by complete submersion is so important. We must completely enter that tomb. We must be completely covered in his blood. The Greek word for baptism in the Bible is pronounced baptizo. This means to make fully wet, dunk, or submerge. This is the only form of baptism prescribed in the New Testament. It was this form Jesus told his disciples to use. It's the only acceptable form in Scripture as being called baptism. Let's look at our Lord for the conclusion of the matter. Jesus is specifically talking here about foot washing and serving one another. I, I've given you an example that you should follow, John thirteen fifteen. I would argue Jesus' example is perfect in all things in every way. Let's look at how Jesus was baptized. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan River. As Jesus came out of the water, he saw heaven split open and the Spirit come down to him as a dove. A voice from heaven said, You are my Son, whom I love. I am pleased with you. Mark 1, 9-11 Jesus was fully submerged in water. If nothing else will persuade us, let the example of our Lord convince us all the perfect way. I have one more verse for us to consider. Would you expect to have clean clothes if you only put half the garment under the cleaning agent? If only half the cloth made it into the water, would you consider it to be clean? We are speaking in a spiritual sense. In this example, half obedience to the guidelines is only having a garment half washed. Jesus said at his baptism, but Jesus answered him, Let it be this way for now, for this is the proper way for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then John let him. Matthew 3.15 Jesus didn't need the baptism of repentance. John was administering. Jesus was sinless. Since God required it, Jesus did it. This is our example to follow. With this in mind, let's read. Sir, I answered, you must know. Then he told me, these are the ones who have gone through the great suffering. They have washed their robes in the blood of the lamb and have made them white. And so they stand before the throne of God and worship him in his temple day and night. The one who sits on the throne will spread his tent over them. They will never hunger or thirst again. And they won't be troubled by the sun or scorching heat. The lamb in the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to the streams of living water, and God will wipe the tears from their eyes. Revelation seven fourteen through 17 I hope this helps us all understand how important baptism really is. Baptism is the washing away of our sin through the blood of Jesus. You are baptized to die with Jesus, so you can also be resurrected with the same resurrection as he was. You are baptized to practice dying to yourself every day of your life. Finally, you were baptized to prepare yourself to die physically for your faith in Jesus. Baptism is the outward expression of relinquishing your life and will to your Lord. I believe, believe this threefold message of baptism is the key to understand what it means to carry your cross. We must walk the earth as if we are dead to it, though we will live forever. If the moment ever comes that we must give our lives for our faith, the decision must have already been confirmed within us. It must have already been walked out daily. Then all we will have to do in that moment is to be as we already are, dead, yet alive forevermore in Christ. It will be nothing more than laying down the cross timbers upon the earth than a gentle passing from this glory into a greater glory. Let's pray. Daddy. My words fail me right now. Help us to abide and obey. I trust you for my salvation. I trust you with my life. All is yours, and so am I. In Jesus' precious and holy name we pray. Amen. All right, so let's recap. In the last chapter, what we talked about was how we are called to bear our cross or carry our cross, and how the disciples intimately knew what that meant. That meant death, right? And that we practice this death through baptism. And we also practice the resurrection through coming out of the water in our baptism. We also learn about the threefold uh, concept of baptism. You're baptized to die with Jesus, so you can also be resurrected with the same resurrection as he was. Number two, you are baptized to practice dying to yourself every day of your life. And number three, finally, you are baptized to prepare yourself to die physically for your faith in Jesus. And that baptism is an outward expression of relinquishing your life and will to your Lord. So, with that being said, let's continue on to day 36. Day 36, Carry Your Cross, Part 2, Precept Number 5. God called you to endure suffering because Christ suffered for you. He left you an example so that you could follow in his footsteps. First. 
Peter 2.21. Let's pray. Daddy, please continue to steady our hearts and minds. We are going even deeper into what it means to carry our cross. Help us to remember our life is a gift from you. Help us to understand that the best way to be grateful for our life is to give it back to you. Your holy word tells us that whatever we give you, you will give back to us a hundred times over. Allow us to invest into your kingdom. Then we can receive an endless return of your blessings. In Jesus' precious and holy name we pray. Amen. In the last chapter, we covered how baptism is the death to self for the believer. We die to the sin from which the blood of Jesus washes us. We no longer live to please the flesh. This way we can live forever with Jesus. We will now continue to go even deeper into the study. As we carry our cross, let's read. No one can serve two masters. He will hate the first master and love the second, or he will be devoted to the first and despise the second. You cannot serve God and wealth. Matthew 6, 24. This point applies to everything in the life. We cannot serve the Spirit of God in our flesh at the same time. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God in glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Philippians 3, 3. The flesh is the enemy as it holds the sin nature. If we live our lives in the rebellious desire of the flesh, we become offensive to a holy God. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile towards God. For it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. And if in fact the spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin... The Spirit is life because of the of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. Romans 8, 6-11 Jesus has given us the guidelines to overcome the flesh. All of you must stay awake and pray that you won't come into temptation. The Spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. Matthew twenty six forty one. Our flesh is weak pertaining to the things of God. Sin has tainted the flesh. The Spirit is strong, for it is God's Spirit within us. The Holy Spirit lives within, so that we can live as He requires us to. We have to choose every day to choose the Spirit over the flesh. Make no mistake about this. You can never make a fool out of God. Whatever you plant is what you will harvest. If you plant in the soils of your corrupt nature, you will harvest destruction. But if you plant in the soils of your spiritual nature, you will harvest everlasting life. We can't allow ourselves to get tired of living the right way. Certainly, each of us will receive everlasting life at the proper time if we don't give up. Galatians 6, 7-9 We must choose to die to ourselves every day. We must choose life through the Spirit every day. If we do not do this, how can we then rise to the occasion? What training will we have participated in to help us to do the right thing? It would be foolish for someone who never learned how to swim to dive headfirst into a pool. We must train in the ways of the Spirit. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to make your calling and election sure. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. 2 Peter 1.10 Be encouraged, family, but I say walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Galatians 5.16 This is our key, walking by the Spirit. Jesus tells us, it is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are Spirit in our life. John six sixty three, We can believe and follow the words of our Lord. When we obey and abide, we will naturally do those things He desires for us. It is not a matter of human effort. It is the effort of the Spirit within us. All that we must do is be willing to be guided by the Spirit, and it will happen naturally. So those who are believers in Christ Jesus can no longer be condemned. Romans 8, 1. We have this blessed hope. I'm convinced that God, who began this good work in you, will carry it through the completion on the day of Christ Jesus, Philippians 1, 6. The flesh longs to live at all cost. History is full of horrific acts of self-preservation. This kind of self-preservation is the idol of self. When we place our own well-being above all precepts, above all others, above all morality, we sin. This is the temple of ego and self. Many have used the excuse of self-preservation as a license to destroy humanity. 
It is sinful demonic to act in this manner. It does not please God of the universe. This, I believe, is one of Satan's strongest techniques to destroy our faith. This carcass of sin will fight you at every step to survive. It wars against the spirit within us. Let us read, because everything that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, it is not from the Father, but is from the world. 1 John 2, 16. I take the lust of the flesh to mean all the provisions the earth can provide. I take the lust of the eyes to be all we can look upon and esteem to be and have. Lastly, I take the pride of life as the desire to live, to continue to consume the lust of the flesh and the eyes. The pride of life is the enemy of those who want to carry their cross. Let us read, but I don't place any value on my own life. I want to finish the race I'm running. I want to carry out the mission I received from the Lord Jesus. The mission of testifying to the good news of God's kindness. Acts 20, 24. Forsaking the pride of life should be our daily goal. Jesus went to the desert to have his spirit dominate his flesh, spiritually resisting the sin that rages in the body of all humanity. Though he has always remained sinless, he did this by fasting for 40 days and nights. His flesh desired to live and yearned for sustenance to do so. In doing so, he told his flesh that he was going to live by the spirit, not the flesh. Shortly after this, Satan came and tempted him again with life. He presented three temptations— I believe these follow exactly what we just read. They are the pride of life, lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes. Let us review the first temptation, lust of the flesh. Jesus did not eat anything for 40 days and 40 nights, and at the end of that time, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. Matthew 4, 2-3. Satan wanted Jesus to deny the spirit within and give in to his flesh. He attacked him in an area of physical need. His flesh needed food. His spirit was stronger than his flesh. He said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. Matthew 4.4 4. Jesus was victorious, so Satan moved on to the next temptation. Temptation number two, the pride of life. I could see it now. Satan thinking to himself, Oh yeah, you don't need food? You trust God to live forever? Well, then prove it. Then the devil took him in to the holy city and had him stand on the highest part of the temple. He said to Jesus, if you are the son of God, jump. Scripture says he will put his angels in charge of you. They will carry you in their hands so that you never hit your foot against the rock. Matthew 4, 5 through 6. Satan wanted Jesus to sin by testing God. Too bad, Satan. Jesus was victorious. Jesus said to him, it is written, you must not tempt the Lord your God. Matthew 4, 7. Coming to the end of the temptations, uh, Satan tries a little razzle-dazzle. Temptation number three, lust of the eyes. Once more, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms and the world and their glory. The devil said to him, I will give you all this if you'll bow down and worship me. Matthew 4, 8 through 9. Again, Satan failed. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and only shall serve him. Matthew 4, 10. Every time Jesus defeated the desires of the flesh with the words of God, he quoted the Bible. Side note, every time the scriptures are mentioned in the New Testament, they were talking about the Old or Older Testament. There was no New Testament at the time. What we call the New Testament is mainly just letters between the believers. So when it says they, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so, Acts 17, 11, they are reading the exact scriptures Jesus used to defeat Satan. The entire Bible is God's word. Everything in scripture is God's word. All of it is useful for teaching and helping people and for correcting them and showing them how to live. The scripture trains God's servants to do all kinds of good deeds. 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17. Is it any wonder Satan wanted to undermine the Bible by dissecting it and separating it into good and bad groups or trying to split the Testaments into Hebrew and Gentile scriptures, implying only some of it is God and some is not? These scriptures are what guide us to live by the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. Romans 8, 5. This is how we are to live. Jesus answered him, It is written, One must not live on bread alone, but every word of God. Luke 4, 4. Again we read, So then, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Romans 10, 17. Without the words in Scripture being stored up in our heart and minds, we are weak and are easy to targets for the enemy. Family, each of the Testaments have been given for our benefit. Yahweh and Jesus our Christ 
own them all. They do not belong to any other than the family of God. Please understand that all Satan has to offer you are the things in this world, nothing else. His hands are filthy and empty. Look at how he tempted Jesus. How pathetic was this? Jesus is the Holy One of God, the express image of the Father. Satan walks up and is like, hey, yeah, you, you know that stuff you created? Yeah, I'll, I'll give it to you. Just roll around on the earth you made and, you know, worship me. Wait, 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 wait. Yes, I know. Yep, it's already yours. But hey, it's all I have to offer. Um, That sounded bad. Never mind. I have to go now. How absurd is it to offer to the creator of the universe a couple of cities, bread, and a bungee jump off a building? How insulting. Now realize every good and pure thing you have is because Jesus has given it to you. Satan might try to offer you again what your Lord already owns. Satan offers would be this. Deny Jesus and I will let you live and you can have what you already have. If we realize we already have it because of the great love of our daddy and Lord, then this offer is insulting. Who thinks that denying the one who gave us everything to keep what he has already given us is a good idea? I surely don't. We must follow the example of Jesus to retain all that we have, be it our families, our houses, cars, money, food, anything at all. Let us read. Humble him, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, death on the cross, Philippians 2.8. Now we will read that what the Bible says about those who do not take Satan's ridiculous offer. And they have conquered him, Satan, by the blood of the Lamb, which is Jesus, and by the word of their testimony, for they love not the their lives, even unto death. Revelation twelve eleven. Satan has nothing to offer a true believer in Christ. We have already received every heavenly blessing through him. We already own the entire universe. And our faithfulness, we also reserve for ourselves immortality. I know, I took more of a lighthearted approach to talk about a very serious topic. I really wanted to expose the absurdity of Satan's offer. Now we will read exactly how God feels about those who become martyrs for their love of God and Jesus. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Psalms 116.15 Again, we read, Don't be afraid of people. They can kill you, but they cannot harm your soul. Instead, you should fear God, who can destroy both your body and your soul in hell. Aren't two sparrows sold for only a penny, but your father knows when any one of them falls to the ground, even the hairs on your head are counted. So don't be afraid. You are worth much more than many sparrows. If you tell others that you belong to me, I will tell my Father in heaven that you are my followers. Matthew 10, 28-32 Be encouraged, family. What will separate us from the love Christ has for us? Can trouble, distress, persecution, hunger, nakedness, danger, or violent death separate us from his love? As scripture says, we are being killed all day long because of you. We are thought as sheep to be slaughtered. The one who loves us gives us an overwhelming victory in all these difficulties. I am convinced that nothing can separate us from God's love, which Christ Jesus our Lord shows us. We can't be separated by death or life, by angels or rulers, by anything in the present or anything in the future, by forces or powers in the world above or in the world below, or by anything else in creation. Romans 8, 35-39 Let's pray. Daddy, I know we have all things pertaining to life and happiness in Jesus Christ. He is our inheritance paid in full. And our Lord and Savior, the completion of promise is revealed. Satan has nothing to offer us. We have a sure word and hope through your love. Let us never be deceived to forfeit all you have given us. Satan offers us the world that will soon be destroyed. You offer yourself in the entire universe, even heaven itself. Jesus offers to share with us everything you have given his highly exalted name. This is on top of dying for us. I ask that we never forget these great examples of love. I praise your righteous holy name and the righteous holy name of your son. Thank you, thank you, and thank you. In Jesus' precious holy name we pray. Amen. Be sure to go to WeShallBeLikeHim.com and download your free copy today of this book. And be sure to share this blessing with those you want to be encouraged in their walk with God. Thank you. God bless you. Until next time, stay strong in the Lord. Joining us in this time of fellowship, visit WeShallBeLikeHim.com to download your free copy 
of a 45-day transformation devotional. Be sure to check out our website at brotherlance.com to stay up to date. We really appreciate your support for sharing with your friends and family and leaving positive reviews. Together, we are sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. This has been the Christian Soul Prepper Podcast, preparing your soul for the second coming. 